So Romans 11, verse 36, it says, For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. Amen. And then if you turn to Colossians 3, 17, it says there, And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So that verse there, whatever you do, in word or deed, do it in the name of Jesus. Well, that's kind of a difficult thing. Um, It says here that Jesus Christ is to fill our every action, every part of our life is supposed to have Jesus in it. So that would include the media that we consume, the screens that we watch. So even when we're having entertainment, we, we're taking Jesus with us no matter what. So we need to always be paying attention to these sorts of things. It's not like we can put Jesus aside when we sit down to watch something. Every show we watch should be done to the glory of God. We need to be able to do that. That might be a difficult thing to do, but as believers... This is what we are called to. So Jesus comes with us to the shows that we watch. He's sitting there with us and he's watching them with us. That's a good thing to keep, it or keep in mind. The Christian Reformed Church has had a complicated history with media, in particular with films and shows and such. If you look back, In 1908 was the first time that movie theater attendance was mentioned in our records. In November 12, 1908, movie theater attendance is first condemned by Henry Beats in the banner. And he said in that article there, to attend movies was to patronize a class of people that frequently caters to the lowest tastes of depraved humanity, actors and actresses and their employers, Movies presented a false view of life, and they commercialize and therefore lower art and literature to an alarming degree. That was in 1908. And uh, in Senate 1928, that was the first official declaration on the topic of film arts. And uh, it gave a warning against attending the theater. And uh, it wouldn't be taken up again until 1951. And they basically forbade anybody to go see a movie at the theater at all and and under any circumstances. That same synod, there was a Calvin Seminary professor who was seen going into a movie theater. And he claims, you be the judge of whether... What, what are you, whatever you think about this, but he claims that he went in to adjust his dentures. But he was seen going into a movie theater, and he was brought to Senate on that charge. And he made a lengthy defense of himself. He promised never to do it again. And they kicked him out. They did not want him to be teaching seminary if he was going to be in a movie theater, even once. After 1928, the, the CRC literature continued to be negative towards the film industry. 1947, it said, movies and the film industry were a moral bubonic plague in this country. And uh, in 1931, the world of motion pictures was where Satan has his throne. So... Not so good. But then something happened. There was a certain movie that came out that really changed people's minds. In 1965, The Sound of Music opened in theaters. 
And that was the movie that really started to get at least people in the Christian Reformed Church talking about, about this again. So in uh, one, one article that I read, it said, CRC members would flock to see the movie depicting a loving family bonded by strong convictions outwitting the Nazis. The film would have a lasting impression on CRC members that movies had potential for service in the kingdom of God. So, this was the movie that got everybody talking about it again. And got people to see, well, maybe films might have some redeeming quality. So, the very next year, Synod adopted declarations. It was called The Church and the Film Arts. And it made film arts a legitimate cultural medium to be used with discernment by Christians. So this was kind of when Senate said, all right, we will, we will open the door to this, but we need to be discerning about it. The general conclusion was that film and television were not merely amusements, but legitimate cultural mediums to be used by the Christian in the fulfillment of the cultural mandate and the church was urged to engage in a responsible critique of the film arts. That was 1966. And uh, that's really the last time that Senate has taken up the topic. So at first, at least in the Christian Reformed Church, we kind of had this, this strategy of avoiding film and television at least as much as possible because it was just kind of all bad. But in the 21st century, this is kind of becoming increasingly unrealistic. Unless you want to go Amish and kind of have that kind of lifestyle, in the 21st century, media is almost unavoidable. It's kind of part of, part of people's daily lives to a great degree. In the first quarter of 2018, there were some data hawks at Nielsen, and they reported that the average American adult spent an average of 11 hours and 6 minutes a day in front of screens. 11 hours a day. And despite inroads of smartphones and tablets, traditional live television still constitutes the biggest chunk of that daily screen time, and that was... Four hours and ten minutes, that's an average adult. And there's many more devices now, too, that are entering the picture that um, allow us to consume media in more and more ways, including computers and smartphones and tablets. And we, we take screens with us wherever we go now. If you have a smartphone... You take a screen with you wherever you go and you have unprecedented access to all sorts of media. So, avoiding it is becoming more and more difficult. Learning to discern is, I would argue, at least for us today, is a better strategy. We need to learn how to discern what is appropriate and what is not. And whatever we consume, we need to do it to the glory of God. It might have been practical to have the avoidance strategy way back when, but it's not really going to work for us very well now. So, we need to learn how to discern. That's kind of the important thing for us now. And the first thing I want to suggest to you is that simply avoiding offensive content is not enough. That is kind of, that is kind of the, maybe the first step but just that by itself is not enough. Sin is just as prevalent in G-rated movies and shows as well as R-rated movies. Sin is in everything that we are going to watch. In a typical G-rated movie, you could find deception or wrath or greed or sloth and other sorts of sins too. Simply not having offensive content is not enough. And the other point about this is that if the Bible were made into a movie, there would be a lot of offensive content in there. If you've read the Song of Solomon or Ezekiel or Judges, there's a lot of what you would call adult content in there. 
And even some years ago when the Passion of the Christ came out, in order to depict a crucifixion and a flogging in a semi-accurate way, it had to be pretty violent. In fact, Roger Ebert, a very famous movie critic, he's uh, passed away now, but he's seen who knows how many movies of The Passion of the Christ. He said, this is the most violent movie I have ever seen. And incidentally, it is still the highest grossing R-rated movie in this country to this day. So avoiding offensive content, that doesn't cut it in itself. And I would submit to you, as somebody who's seen lots of movies and is kind of a, an amateur movie critic, that more hazardous than offensive content to your mind are the ideas that are in the movies the assumptions that are made, and the way life is depicted. That is more hazardous to our minds than the offensive content even. So every story carries a certain view of the world, a certain view of life, and a certain view of people. So questions to ask if you're viewing or consuming any story at all is, for example, what is funny? What does true love mean? What is the purpose of life? Where do people find fulfillment and meaning? There's a lot of stories out there that are pretty clean in terms of offensive content, but they are pretty wrong on some of those questions. For example, when I was growing up, I was only allowed to watch G and PG rated movies until I was probably like 16. And so a lot of Disney classics were what we stuck with. And, you know, not very offensive. Those are all rated G or almost all of them. But many of them show that romance is what is life's greatest fulfillment. When you find a romantic partner, this is kind of the peak of human existence. And even though I probably knew better a little bit, I kind of carried those ideas with me a little bit. And by the time I got a girlfriend for the first time and I realized that, well, romance isn't everything that it said in a Disney movie, that was quite a shock. Or the notion that you can be anything if you put your mind to it. If you work hard and you're committed to it, then you can achieve it. Well, that's not really true. You and I, we all have limits. There are certain things that we are gifted in and certain things that we are not. And those are just some simple examples, but more important than the offensive content, I would submit to you are the ideas that films and shows carry. If you look at the Bible, there's a lot of what you might call offensive content. In the Bible, sin is plentiful, but it's always shown for what it is. You have a lot of people in the Bible who are making the wrong choices in many places, but it's always shown for what it is. So if you take somebody like Samson, and here's a guy who really had a, a lust problem, a woman problem, and uh, he had a problem with anger and vengeance and things like that, but all of his mistakes are shown to be what they really are. He gets himself in a lot of trouble because of these things. Or David and Bathsheba. The devastation that was that story is shown for what it is. And even though that was a wrong thing to do, sin is always shown as sin in the Bible. But not always in the stories that we consume or watch. Stories are very powerful. They have, they give us purpose, meaning, and direction. And even the Bible itself often uses story to get the point across. One of Jesus' favorite responses to a question was, well, let me tell you a story. The parables. He uses 
story to get a point across. When the Pharisees said, look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath when they were picking grain, Jesus said, well, haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread. And that wasn't lawful for them to do, only for the priests. He's using story as a precedent. In the epistles, the Old Testament is used a lot to teach and explain different truths. So much of God's revelation to us is by narrative. There's some people, maybe even us some of the time, that we might have wished that God had just given us a catechism because that would have been more straightforward. But a lot of what God has given to us in His Word is narrative, story. And I think that's because the stories are very powerful for shaping us and telling us who God is. And just as story is powerful in Scripture, it's also powerful in the world of media too. But at the same time, as powerful as these stories are, I want to throw this out there for you. Every good story has to borrow from the big story. Every good story that's out there, somehow, somewhere, has to use God's story. It's impossible to tell a story that's going to resonate with a human heart that God created without tapping into or following the pattern of God's story. It's impossible to do it. We have to tap into God's grand story of creation and fall and redemption in order to tell a story that's compelling. We can warp the truth, but we can't ignore it. We can't escape it. So in every story, there is creation and fall and redemption. That's the main story arc. So, just give you a couple examples here. Um, Home Alone is a movie that's often shown on, on Christmas time, and I remember seeing it when I was... Uh, I think I was 10 years old when that came out. So in that movie, the creation part of the story would be the family at the beginning, where Kevin has his family. Family is a good thing that God created, and so he starts out with a family there, but the fall is his falling out with the family and wishing that they were gone. The redemption at the end is where he's reunited with his family, and he realizes that family is very important. Creation, fall, redemption. Or how about one that I'm sure many of you have seen? It, it's a wonderful life, it's shown a hundred times every Christmas. Well, creation is George Bailey has family, friends, and job. These are good things that God created, and that was kind of the creation part. The fall is his loss of $8,000, and uh, thinking that he should have never been born because of the trouble that that brought. So that was the fall, and then his redemption is realizing at the end that he really did have a wonderful life. Creation, fall, redemption. It's in every good story that's out there. Some stories even have a character that is being like Christ. Lots of superhero movies have this sort of thing where somebody sacrifices themselves for the sake of others or risks their life for the sake of others. Um... And then, just uh, I have a bunch of examples here. Uh, the Hunger Games, for example. Katniss Everdeen is somebody who kind of stands out as a moral character um, in a world of brutality. And she voluntarily offers herself as tribute so that they don't take a younger, younger sibling. Casablanca, that's a big classic. With Humphrey Bogart. At the end of that movie, maybe some of you have seen that, Rick has Elsa get on the plane instead of stay with him. He kind of sacrifices his own interests for hers. Or let's take Superman, for example. Listen to the, this is the description of the movie Superman, or a description. Superman is given a mission by his father to come to earth, endowed with incredible powers, and be a certain savior of the human race as well as an inspiring example of virtue. 
kind of like Christ. Or the Lord of the Rings. There's a lot of Christ characters, but Frodo, for example, he carries the burden of evil on behalf of the world, walking to Mount Doom and nearing the place. He needs some help to carry this heavy burden, and upon accomplishing his mission, says it is done. These are all echoes of Christ here. When you know God's story well, you see that every other story is derivative. Every other story that's out there borrows from God's story. And whatever story you pick up, you can find evidence for that. It takes some practice, and it takes, it takes some thought, but you can find God's story, or at least remnants of it, in every story that's out there that's told. Every story has a redemption at the end. Every human being that's out there, whether they know Christ or not, is looking for some sort of redemption. And films know this, stories know this, television knows this, and so they plug into that. Everybody seeks some sort of redemption. So a question that we need to ask whenever we're taking in a story is how well does this story's redemption match with the real redemption? How well does it match up? So, on the better side, some stories, some films, some shows, will have uh, at their redemption being related to the importance of family or marriage or friends or serving your country or protecting the innocent or the notion that it's better to give than to receive. On the better end, those are part of the redemptive stories in uh, some of the better ones out there. On the worst side, there's some redemption stories that make redemption about either getting revenge or having sex or getting rich or things like that. How well does this story's redemption match with the real redemption. Because the only true redemption is Jesus Christ. He's the only redemption. And there's a lot of other stories out there that give you some small redemptions. But do these fit with the real redemption? That's a good question to ask whenever you're taking in a story. How well does this fit with the real redemption? Very few stories out there actually have Jesus Christ as a part of their redemption. Very few. And some of those have quite a bit of offensive content in them. If you want names of specific ones, ask me afterwards. So, media for him. Media for Jesus. I have just some six things for you here. First of all, if you are under your parents' roof, obey your parents. That, that should be a, a first thing to say. Follow your parents' rules for what you should view and what you should not view. Colossians 3.20, children, obey your parents in everything for this pleases the Lord. That would include what you're watching, what you're taking in. And that needs to be the case, even if you think it's unreasonable. Because when I was growing up, <clears throat> I thought that my parents' rules on this were unreasonable. And there were times when I broke that. There were times when I thought, this film would be okay for me to watch. I'm going to watch it. Mom and Dad doesn't have to know. And that was wrong. I should not have done that. That was a sin. Because I dishonored my father and mother. So... If you're under your parents' roof, whether you like it or not, whether it's reasonable or not, obey your parents. Number two, anything that would cause you to sin, avoid it at all costs. This is the offensive content part that we need to pay attention to. If bad language on screen causes you to use bad language, then avoid all things that have bad language. If sexual content on screen causes you to lust, then avoid that at all costs. 
If wealth on screen causes you to have discontentment and envy, then avoid that. Do whatever it takes to not sin. Because there is no story out there, no film, no message or anything out there that is worth sacrificing or jeopardizing or compromising your relationship with the Lord. Nothing out there is worth that. Matthew 5, 29 and 30. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. Jesus is talking to believers here. It is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. Even though we don't have to fear hell because of God's grace, sin is still very grave. And it, the wages of sin is still death. And so we need to avoid sin at all costs. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Nothing is worth offending our greatest love. Nothing. Number three, identify the ideas that the stories bring to you. What is the redemption? That might be a key question. So whether you're reading a book, watching television, or taking in a film, what is the redemption here? Some of those redemptions fit a little better with the true redemption than others. What is the redemption here? Is sin shown for what it truly is? Or is it shown to be something as part of the redemption even? Let's not believe the world's redemption. Let's always make sure that it fits with the real redemption. Number four, most important is to be firmly grounded in God's story. Stories are powerful for shaping who we are, how we think, even in subtle ways. And so more important, I would say most important, is that you are deeply grounded in God's story. And as somebody who has seen a lot of movies in my day, some of them I wish that I hadn't, the thing that has held me strong more than anything else is that I've been grounded in God's story. I know it very well. And the more I study it, the more I love it. And I hope that you can say the same thing. That is the most important thing. Be grounded firmly in God's story so that you know and are shaped by this story more than any other one. Number five, appreciate beauty, talent, and creativity. There's a lot of good stuff out there. And we can appreciate that. We can enjoy it. The fact that God is a creator and we are made in his image, suggests that art, just the notion of art, is part of our created nature. And this is a good thing. And so we tend to create art as human beings, and this is good. And when we find good art, let's appreciate it. Let's enjoy it. But last and not least, find God's story in every story so that every story points you to God. Romans 11.36 For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. Make sure that whatever story you're taking in, that you are using it to point you back to who God is so that whatever story you are taking in is pointing you back to God and so that you give Him all of the glory. Make every story points you to the real story, to the glory of God. It takes some practice to do, but get in the habit of doing it. And you can consume media to the glory of God. Let's bow our heads. Our God in heaven, there's lots of good art out there and there's lots of junk out there. And Lord, there's lots of things that would give us different redemptions than Jesus Christ. And Lord, there's some that are fitting better than others. Lord, we want, we want to do all things to the glory of your name and because of Jesus Christ. So Lord, in a media-saturated culture that we are living in, help us to do just that. And Lord, equip us with discernment so that we can always be pointed back to your story, the ultimate story, the one that shapes and defines us. 
And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.